So here are some principles about the liturgy that we should recall in the process of getting ready for these new translations. Christ is always present in his church, especially in its liturgical celebrations. Just as a sidebar to these numbers that you, uh, you'll see from time to time, we'll display the quotations in sections, so you'll see that the, the number uh, from the various documents. Okay? Christ is present in his church through the minister, the priest. He is also present in the Eucharistic elements, the body and blood of Christ. He's present in the sacraments, which are an encounter with him in different ways to serve us and to assist us in our life's journey. He's present in the word of scripture as it is proclaimed. And he is always present in all of us gathered together. Remember, where two or three are gathered, I am with you. The earthly liturgy is the foretaste of the heavenly liturgy, celebrated in the holy city of Jerusalem, toward which we journey as pilgrims, where Christ sitting at the right hand of God the Father watches all of us and is with us. It is the worship of the whole body of Christ of which we are members. And in the liturgy, the whole public worship is performed by the mystical body, Jesus Christ, that is the head, Jesus, and we are his members. Now the liturgy is also the source and summit of who we are. Liturgy is the summit toward which the activity of the church is directed. And at the same time, it is the font from which all of our powers flow. For the aim and object of the apostolic works is that all who are made sons and daughters of God by faith and baptism should come together to praise God in the midst of his church, to take part in the sacrifice and to eat the Lord's Supper. The liturgy is the summit toward which this activity is directed and the same, at the same time, the font. So why or is liturgy a font? If you look at the meaning of the word font, you can see all the different descriptions. Source, origin, it's a cause, it's a bud, it's a germ, it's an egg, it's a rudiment, it's a genesis, a beginning, birth, a starting point, an entrance, mainspring, groundwork, foundation, well, reservoir, and reason. In other words, the liturgy is the source of the church's power. And the summit, what does summit mean? It's the highest point, it's the top, it's the apex, it's the zenith, pinnacle, culmination, the utmost, the maximum, the climax, the peak, the crest. It's unsurpassed, it's superlative. In other words, the highest point toward which the work of the church is directed is the liturgy. So to be clear, just go over again. We look at the liturgy as the source and summit which the church is directed because the liturgy is the most effective way possible for achieving human sanctification and God's glorification. And these are the end to which all of the church's other activities are directed. The church earnestly desires that all the faith will be led to a full, conscious, and active participation in their liturgical celebrations, called by the very nature of who we are in liturgy. This full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered above all else because it is the primary and indispensable source from which the faithful are to derive their true Christian spirit. So we pray the Mass, do not just pray during Mass, we pray at all times, not just at Mass. Active participation, what does that mean? Active participation is the engagement in the postures and the processions, the acclaiming, the praying, the singing, and also the silences of the rites. Conscious participation. We surrender to becoming the assembly of the church, giving self over to something bigger than who we are as self, saying a conscious yes to God's presence and his activity. Full participation, the openness to God's transforming action, being transformed by the Holy Spirit into an ever more perfect member of the body of Jesus Christ. 
we can participate in an exterior way. Exterior participation is that which we can observe and see. We participate by doing all of the parts assigned to the people at Mass, such as praying, singing, responding, processing, listening, standing, sitting, kneeling, shaking hands, eating, and drinking. Note that the participation in the verbal parts was facilitated after Vatican II because the liturgy began to be celebrated in the vernacular, English. How it, easy it is to participate in an outward way, singing, giving the appropriate responses, receiving communion, but not allowing ourselves to be really touched to the core of who we are, to our being. We know the liturgy by heart, and sometimes that can make our participation our mechanical way of life becomes automatic. Scarcely are we aware of what we're doing. Scarcely are we aware of what is happening around us. Sometimes we daydream. Sometimes we think about other things. So we need to participate through our heart as well. We have, intentionally, we have to intentionally do what we're doing. No matter what is going on in your life or my life, we participate to the best of our ability today, that Mass that we're attending. I will listen to what God is saying to me, saying to my heart, to the core of my being. I will take that message with me into the experiences of the day and the week and the month to come. I will live out what I proclaim in the liturgy and work for the reign of God in our midst today. So ultimately, Liturgical participation means participating in the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, his dying and rising. We do it with him, his laying down our, our lives for his and for one another. Now, participation also means sometimes we're silent. Sometimes we say nothing. It is a form of our participation in the liturgy. Also, to participate means we have some rights and duties. A right is a privilege. We have a right to participate through our baptism, through who we are as baptized brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. We have a duty. A duty is a responsibility. And we have, that means we have an obligation to participate in the liturgy by who we are as baptized Christians. So to summarize the church's desire for the faithful of the liturgy, the church wants full participants. Should not, there should not be strangers. There should not be silent spectators. But there should be full participants through a good understanding of the rites and prayers. They should take part in the sacred action, conscious of what they're doing, with devotion and with collaboration. We should be instructed by God's word, and be nourished at the table of the Lord's body. We should give thanks to God by offering the immaculate victim, our Lord Jesus, not only through the hands of the priest, but also through him, our Lord, we also offer ourselves. We offer our very lives in the liturgy. And through Christ, our mediator, we are drawn day by day into the ever more perfect union with Jesus Christ and his Father and the Spirit with one another. So finally that God may be called all in all. As we celebrate, as we participate in the liturgy, we move out throughout a liturgical year. During one liturgical year, the church celebrates the entire mystery of Jesus Christ. Within the cycle of a year, the church unfolds the whole mystery from his incarnation and birth that we just celebrated now just a few months ago, until his ascension, the day of Pentecost, the expectation of the blessed hope of the Lord's return. Sunday is the foundation and core of that liturgical year. On the Lord's Day, we come together, as many of us here at St. Matthew's do. We come together as faithful to Jesus Christ, to hear the word of God and to take part in the Eucharist, to call to mind the passion, the resurrection, and the glorification of our Lord Jesus, and to thank God who gives us hope. But we also celebrate that liturgical year of seasons. We preserve the customs of the seasons on purpose. The liturgical year is to be focused on those as we move throughout the 
the liturgical life. It is revised so that it's the traditional customs and discipline of sacred seasons shall be preserved and restored to suit the condition of our modern times. Vatican II tells us. There are precedences in the celebrations. The proper of the seasons are offered as well. And we focus sometimes on saints, on how they celebrated the liturgy and how they live their lives. So the saints, the seasons, and the feasts of the Lord are all celebrated together. We also can focus on sacred music. We have a wonderful program here at St. Matthew's led by Tom Staley. Focus is always should be on the liturgy and enhancing the liturgy. And also we can use sacred art. Art helps us to focus in a different way on the way of life and the liturgy of God. So to refresh our memories here for a moment on the liturgy as uh, the Vatican II has asked us, but also it has some other actions and possibilities to think about. At this point, we like to talk about the liturgy not in a chronological order, the liturgical year, but to think about it in a different way. We have the kinetic experiences as we go through the liturgy. There is movement, posture, gestures, and actions, processions. And we have acoustic experiences, the words, sung and spoken, and silence. Most people focus on the verbal parts of the Mass, the words. But let's take a moment and look at the nonverbal ways that we pray our liturgy to help us broaden our understanding of the nature and the ritual of worship. Postures, standing. What does it mean? It means honor and readiness. Sitting, listening, meditating, kneeling, adoration, lowliness, repentance. The symbolic gestures that we make in Mass or when we're saying a prayer. Making the sign of the cross marks us as followers of Christ, one of the greatest signs, simple sign of who we are as Christians. Shaking hands means peace, means communion with one another, it means charity. Actions, other actions like genuflecting, it means reverence, it means adoration. When we bow, we offer a sign of honor or respect. When we're in processions, there's an entrance procession, there's a gospel procession, there's a gifts pr procession, there's a communion procession, there's a recessional. Very important. If you focus on that and think about it, the processions of our regular masses also are highlighted in the most important week of the year, Holy Week. There is a procession of palms. There's a procession of the chrism for, for the, at the chrism mass. There's a procession of the transfer of the Eucharist. There's a procession of the cross on Good Friday. There's the procession of the Easter candle at the Easter vigil. We gather together to begin to shift focus, and say, why have we come to give glory to God when we gather at mass? When we leave our recessional, we offer leave taking in a sense, we leave with a mission from Mass to do good works, to praise and bless God. The liturgy also has words attached to it, as you all know. Scripture. God speaks to us. Christ present in the Word. He himself speaks to us through the Holy Scriptures as they are read in church. And we make those words our own. When we hear in preaching, we learn the meaning of the Scriptures or on the feast day that we are celebrating about the special feast or the saint that we're, we are honoring that day. We hear how we should apply those readings and the activities of the saints and the activities of our Lord Jesus to ourselves. When we listen to the presidential prayers, the text that the priest prays himself, they include an opening prayer, a colic, that gathers us all in to that prayer gathers us into the liturgy itself, the liturgy of the Eucharist. There's a prayer over the offerings, which accept and bless the gifts that we have presented. There's the Eucharistic prayer, the center and the summit of the Mass itself. And we ask that the Eucharist that we have just celebrated through our communion be the spiritual effect of allowing us to bear fruit in our lives. 
in our congregational texts that we use. There are dialogues. There's the greeting after the readings. There's the preface, the litany, Lord have mercy. There's the general intercessions, the Lamb of God, the glory to God in a prayer of praise and joy. We offer a creed. We offer acclamations. We offer the Lord's Prayer. In the processional chants, there's an entrance song. It offers preparation and unity for us. The communion song reminds us to be in union in spirit, in communion with one another, that we should have a joy of heart, for we have just received Christ. When we sing, music, its choices correspond to the spirit in a liturgical action. And they foster the participation of all the faithful who are gathered. And again, when we are silent, we have an opportunity to recollect, to meditate, and to offer a private prayer.